Michael Rothberg. I'm the 1939 Society uh, Samuel Getz Chair in Holocaust Studies at UCLA. And on behalf of the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to the 1939 Society Program in Holocaust Studies and for staying socially distant and intellectually engaged by joining us for these virtual events. As always, I want to thank the Levy Center staff for helping to make the arrangements uh, for this event. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, you to a conversation with Professor Genevieve Zubrisky. Genevieve Zubrisky is Professor of Sociology and Faculty Associate at the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. She's also Director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia and the Copernicus Center in Polish Studies at UM. She's written extensively on nationalism and religion, collective memory and national mythology and the contested memory of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. Professor Zubrisky's numerous publications in these areas have brought her much acclaim. Her first book, The Crosses of Auschwitz, Nationalism and Religion in Post-Communist Poland, which was published by University of Chicago Press in 2006 and translated into Polish, won prizes from the American Sociological Association, the Association for Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies, and the Polish Studies Association. Her second book, also published by Chicago, uh, is Beheading the Saint, uh, Nationalism, Religion, and Secularism in Quebec, which was published in 2016 and translated into French and Polish. That book also won prizes from the American Sociological Association, the Canadian Sociological Association, and the International Society for the Sociology of Religion. Professor Zubrisky is currently completing a book on the ongoing Jewish revival in Poland and non-Jewish Poles interest in all things Jewish. And that book is tentatively entitled Anti-Semitism, Philo-Semitism, and the Politics of Memory in Contemporary Poland. She's published on that project in the Journal of Contemporary History, Comparative Studies in Society and History, and the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion. So today's conversation is gonna go into depth on uh, certain aspects of uh, that new book project. So welcome and thank you for joining us, uh, Genevieve. Um, we're talking now uh, just a few days before International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which takes place on January 27th and marks the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So maybe you could start by talking a little bit about the significance of that day in Poland and in particular of Auschwitz in Polish consciousness. Sure. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. Um, it's great to be with you virtually. Uh, I'm in Paris, so the apartment is dark because it's night here. Well, it's, it's bright uh, and warm and, and sunny in LA. Um, I'll start with the, the second question, actually, and answer uh, or tell you a little bit about the meaning of Auschwitz in Poland before talking about uh, the significance of the day and the commemorations on January 27th. So uh, first of all, in Poland, pe people make a distinction between uh, Auschwitz or Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II or Birkenau. Auschwitz I was initially created for Polish political prisoners, uh, for Soviet prisoners of war, for uh, uh, German homosexuals, uh, criminals, socialists, and other groups deemed deviant. And uh, it was not an extermination camp, it was a concentration camp. And about 100,000 Poles were uh, interned in that camp and 70,000 were killed there. Of course, in that number and in the, the, the total number of, of prisoners at Auschwitz, Auschwitz I, there were Jews, of course. But there's a distinction between concentration and extermination camps. Now, in 1942, uh, the Germans built Birkenau in a nearby village, Brzezinka, about two, three kilometers from Auschwitz I. Uh, and they built it for the sole purpose of, of, of uh, the extermination of European Jewry. And this is where 
between 1 million and 1.2 million European Jews were exterminated in gas chambers or executed or uh, were murdered uh, through starvation and disease. So Oshvienchim, this is how Poles from the very beginning of the, of the Second World War were referring to Auschwitz, the concentration camp. And it became very quickly part of the understanding of what the war the consequences of the war for the Polish population. I mean, the goal also was to um, to get rid of Polish intel intelligentsia so that so that Germans could better basically dominate Poland. Um, so there's there's that understanding or kind of semantic, not conflict, but distinction between those two camps. And for Poles, Auschwitz I is the Polish camp and Birkenau is the Jewish camp. Now, we also have to understand that the history of World War II in Poland was uh, under communism was told according to very specific ideological parameters. It was not told about, it was not a story about the Holocaust. It was not a story about the murder of 6 million Jews but of one, a battle of, of, of fascist aggression against a bunch of nations who were then uh, liberated by the glorious Soviet army. So this, this was basically how the story was told in history books and monuments and commemorations of all sorts, including at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum, which was created on a law based uh, called uh, the law on, on the Polish martyrdom, the, the martyrdom of the Polish nation and other nations. So all of the, the specific context of post-war Poland being under the Soviet orbit, plus the specific history of Auschwitz I, plus also this kind of general self-understanding of Poles as victims of history and a long tradition of, of basically martyrdom as a Polish trait really made Oświęcim like a, a core symbol of Polish identity. Um, and this, with the fall of communism, this started to change. And this was not an easy transformation. So what happened in 1989, and especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, First, you have um, the opening of Soviet archives. So since it's the Red Army that liberated Auschwitz and Birkenau specifically, it's not the Americans, they had a bunch of documentary evidence that they had in the Soviet Union. And that becomes available to researchers all over the world. And they uh, quickly establish a, a, a much more uh, specific number of victims to between one and 1.2 millions of both camps. And they clearly establish and state that 90% of those victims were Jewish. And that was a shock in Poland. That was very difficult to understand when for 50 years, it was implied that the majority of the victims were Polish. The second thing is that with democratization and once Poland was no longer under Soviet domination, there was no need to tell the story of World War II or of the camp according to socialist paradigm. And that's when slowly also with tourists uh, from the rest of the world starting to come and visit Poland and visit Auschwitz-Birkenau, that Poles come into contact with a very different telling of the history of World War II and of those two camps. Um, and there's a very strong reaction to that because for many Poles, especially Poles, older Poles, um, for them, Oświęcim was a key site of the Polish nation's martyrdom. So there's reactions of several kinds, including, for example, self-defined Poles Catholics who went in 1998 and 1999 and erected hundreds of crosses just outside the museum to insist that that site was a site of Polish martyrdom. Um, what's, um, you know, the commemorations, now to get back to your initial question, the commemorations of, of January 27th were always uh, 
you know, an important moment, especially for the Soviets to show how grand they were because they had liberated the camp. After the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, that's no longer appropriate. Um, and so the socialist spin is dropped and there's less and less about Polish victimhood and more and more about Jewish victimhood and about the Holocaust. Um, and again, that generates vigorous opposition in different social groups and political camps. But over time, what we see, because uh, big survey uh, research organizations were polling people before the commemoration and after the commemoration. So for example, 1995, 2000, 2005, et cetera, every five years they would do those polls. And they noticed that among um, the younger generation, uh, the commemorations did have an, an impact and effect in actually teaching people that Auschwitz was a site of, you know, a key site of the Holocaust and that it was the primary site, the primary victims were Jewish. So the commemorations have uh, an educational function and also it has a PR function for the Polish government because you have all the parties involved who attend and the world is watching. So you have, of course, Germans, Israelis, Poles, Russians. Uh, you have representatives of the EU and the United States. So it becomes a platform where Poland can also either shine or try to push its own agenda. So I think that's... Um, what I can tell you about the significance of both Auschwitz and Polish consciousness and of the importance of that specific day, January 27th. That's interesting, your point about how the commemoration seemed to have had an effect on, uh, on sort of consciousness of the Jewish character of the, at least Auschwitz to Birkenau. Um, do you, have there also been changes in education in this period? Has that also in schools and school textbooks, um, has the narrative changed uh, across the transition from communist era yes. to communist? So, I mean, you have, of course, the museum itself after uh, in the early 90s changes its narrative. The exhibit remained the same and it still is the same, although there's always you know, hope that there will be a new exhibit. It's very difficult on, on uh, you know, for preservation issues, etc. cetera. Um, it revised the narrative by not hiding Jews anymore. So uh, it used to be that Jews were folded into, they were, you know, Jews were presented as, you know, citizens of Poland, of Hungary, etc. So they were folded into na national narratives and were disappearing. So then the, 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 the the museum revised this, retrained their guides, but you're right that yes, the Holocaust appeared, started appearing in textbooks, especially for high school students earlier, it's a little bit, you know, for younger kids, it's too, it's too difficult. Um, but Poland doesn't have, unlike France, for example, where there's like one textbook, you know, it's more like the US or several approved textbooks. And depending on which one your teacher might take, um, you know, there might be more or less about the Holocaust in that textbook, but specific textbooks about the Holocaust and, and also textbooks for teachers on how to teach the Holocaust were also created in the late 1990s and are still used. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that's happened in recent years that in some ways counteracts some of the, the sort of positive aspects of this nar narrative, or at least as it's seen from abroad, is um, you know, what's known as the Holocaust speech law. And I know you've been thinking about this and writing about this as well. So how does this speech law um, fit into this whole story? And could you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Sure, yes. Um, so it's interesting because the, the speech law was uh, voted, approved by uh, the parliament on January 26, 2018. And a lot of observers were saying, oh my gosh, polls are so, you know, tactless and what a lack of political finesse when actually it was 
intentional. They wanted to use the following day, the commemoration of the 27th as a platform to make their case. And what was their case? What They wanted to set the record straight on basically uh, what they call alleged Polish guilt, right? So what they wanted to do with this law is to show that Pol Poles were not the perpetrators of the Holocaust, that Germans were, and that Poles were in fact victims. So they wanted in a way to walk back some of the progress that had been made and really again kind of insist on Polish victimhood. Um, and the law is actually an amendment to a law that was already in existence. Um, and the amendment is uh, that, that really captured the attention um, the world, all over the world, um, is very specific. And I want to read it to you because it really captures what's going on. So um, it's whoever claims publicly and contrary to the facts that the Polish nation or the Republic of Poland is responsible or co-responsible for Nazi crimes committed by the Third Reich or whoever otherwise grossly diminishes the responsibility of the true perpetrators of said crimes shall be liable to a fine or imprisonment for up to three years. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I mean, basically you can't claim that Poles or Poland, the Polish nation participated in the Holocaust and even uh, claiming or showing, arguing that there's anything that would diminish the responsibility of Germans in the Holocaust is also liable for criminal pursuit. Um, so what was that about, right? I mean, why, what's going on? And actually the, the government that, that um, proposed this amendment and that voted it into law um, was reacting, it's law and justice. It's a populist right-wing government. Um, it controls both the house uh, and uh, the presidency. Um, and they were reacting to a very important movement of soul searching uh, in Poland and of new research on Polish participation in the Holocaust that started in 2000 with the publication of a book by Jan Tomasz Gross, Polish born, Princeton based uh, sociologist historian um, who published a book called Neighbors, which tells in, in painful graphic details how ethnic Poles tortured, murdered, uh, brought uh, into a barn and burned alive their Jewish neighbors in a small town of Yedwabne in 1941. Uh, the publication of, of this book had a tremendous impact in Poland and on Polish consciousness. Uh, it really shook Polish identity to its core because it was um, it was showing that not only Poles were not the main victims of the Holocaust was the, what the revision of Auschwitz was had done, but it had perpetrated some of its horror. Um, and then you had like a, a, a criminal investigation. Uh, then you had new commemorate new monument, a new commemorative commemoration, and Apologies from the president of Poland, uh, Alexander Kwasniewski, uh, from the, the, the leftist union, um, acknowledging the crimes. Um, so on the one hand, you have this kind of awakening to this and disenchantment and demystification of the Polish narrative, what I call a narrative shock that's operating. Uh, people talk about these things and take it in. Others turn to denial saying Germans did it or uh, uh, Poles did it, but they were forced by Germans or, um, you know, they might say uh, there were not as many Jews as Gross claimed in his book or the Jews had it coming after all because, you know, they were uh, complicit. They were actually uh, had collaborated with the Soviets when the Soviets were occupying that Eastern part of Poland. Um, so you have like these two, you know, reactions to it. Scholars 
after 2001 started really digging deeper and a lot of people started to do research on on uh, theft of Jewish property, blackmail of Jews during and after the war, uh, murder of Jews, intimidation, all sorts of that, these terrible things um, that they did during and after the war. And then Gross published another book in 2006 called Fear that was again showing that um, uh, Poles murdered some Jews in pogroms after the end of World War II because they were afraid that Jews were coming back for their property. Um, so there's a new um, Holocaust school that emerged from that movement. And that's what the law and justice government is trying to repress and to stop with that law. These are the, the scholars public intellectuals and journalists who write about what happened in Poland during and after the war uh, that they want to basically uh, stop. Um, and uh, you had a, a clip, I think, that you oh, wanted. Oh, I want to show you a clip, <laughs> yes. yes, yes. I want to show you a clip about, I want to show you a clip of Prime Minister Morawiecki uh, two days after the commemorative law, just to show you how he's presenting actually what the law is doing. And you see in that clip, the entire agenda of the Law and Justice Party and how it's directed to foreign audiences as much as to uh, national audiences. And you'll see it's a magnificent example of propaganda. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Polish nation suffered greatly during the Second World War. Poland, in its entirety, was under a dual German and Soviet occupation. Practically every Polish family mourned the loss of loved ones who perished at the hands of these occupying powers. Poland was the first victim of the Third Reich during the war. Death and suffering in the Nazi German concentration camps was a fate shared by Jews, Poles, and those of many other national and ethnic groups. Similar laws operate in other countries across Europe and the world. Holocaust denial is not only the denial of German crimes, but also other ways of falsifying history. One of the worst types of this lie occurs when someone diminishes the responsibility of real perpetrators and attributes that responsibility to their victims. We want to fight against this lie in its every form. This is why we are amending the law of the Institute of National Remembrance. The Polish state and individual Polish citizens have worked to ensure that the German concentration camps are preserved as memorials and physical reminders of the traumatic history at these sites. In its struggle against false claims, imputing the participation of the Republic of Poland in the German crime machine, Poland advocates for the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holocaust was also an unthinkable tragedy for Poland. That the Nazi enacted a death penalty for Poles hiding Jews shows that the Germans knew Poles would help their Polish Jewish brothers. We fully understand the emotions of Israel. There is a tremendous amount of work ahead of us to weave our shirt of a complicated past into a common historical narrative we can tell together. Today, as the world must once again fight against new waves of anti-Semitism, the Polish government states its position clearly. There is no room for hatred or the distortion of history. So, so yeah, wow. That so, as you say, that really is a kind of extraordinary 
work of propaganda. And I'm, I'm struck by so many different things. I mean, uh, the fact that it's in English, this kind of emphasis on Polish suffering, the dual, the dual occupation that it mentions. There's so much there. <laughs> All that, that's pretty standard in Polish, mm -hmm. you know, narrative. Mm -hmm. But the twist there is that uh, the prime minister represents Poland as the keeper of truth, right? And so they, they are the one who are defending against deniers, Holocaust deniers. Mm -hmm. That's a very dangerous twist. And you know, on the one hand, you see images to fly over a beautiful countryside of Poland, modern cities, etc. It's to show that Poland is like this great place. Um, but we woven into this, you also have pictures that Poles will recognize, you know, of specific heroes that, um, you know, North Americans won't recognize. So it's really at different levels. It's a very, very astute, um, video both in terms of its ideological content but also visually so i you know i i hope i can write an entire article on this because it really deserves really unpacking you know the several layers um in there absolutely it's fascinating um so i mean i think it's fair to say that internationally the response to the the speech law to go back to that specifically has been pretty negative, right? There's been a lot of criticism from scholars, from journalists around the world. But what what actually have been the reactions in within Poland, and and has the law had the the feared effect, right? That that many outside of Poland have worried mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the the reaction in Poland was obviously divided, right? So you had people who say, well, you know, just like right on and let's show the world that we're not the Nazis and that we actually were in many of those camps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, scholars, public intellectuals, journalists, students, you know, were very, very quick in denouncing the law, protesting, so protesting physically in several places, you know, in Warsaw, uh, petitions, letters, uh, etc. Members of the Polish diaspora, also, you know, in Europe, in 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 England, especially England, Ireland, France, where there's a strong Polish community, um, uh, in the U.S. Obviously, academic institutions where you know Polish studies in the U.S. as well have been. So there, the, you know, you have on the one hand people who think this is great, and others who react very strongly against this. Um, the law, I should say, was um, after negotiations with Israel, actually, the, the, the criminalization, so that, that prison sentence has been removed. Mm -hmm. um, and both prime ministers of Poland and Israel made uh, a, a common statement, actually, then approving that law. Um, so actually then, uh, you know, a lot of people in Poland were very disappointed uh, that there had been any kind of support for that law. Um, in terms of its effect, actually, even though they removed, you know, the prison sentence, it's a very effective law uh, in creating self-censorship. So if you think that you might be sued for, you know, mentioning that, you know, some polls or that one private person did participate in the program or whatnot, uh, you might actually not write that article. Uh, when you think of graduate students choosing what topics they're gonna write the dissertation on, given especially that um, unlike the US, you know, in Europe, research is funded by federal grants, you know, uh, journals, Going into that really create a topic like that would create significant impediment to your, you know, career trajectory, um, and you're liable to be sued. And this very week, actually, Jan Grabowski and his colleague Barbara Engel King are are sued and are appearing in court in Warsaw uh, for an edited.
film that's called um, Dalai Yes Nots in English. It's uh, Night Without End, The Fate of Jews in Selected Counties of Occupied Poland. Um, because in one of the chapters, they referred to one, you know, man in one county who engage in whatever action and his niece now is suing them. Um, and actually pr previous iterations of that law were nicknamed in, in Poland, Gross's law. You know, so they were meant to target Jan Gross and they were meant to target people like him, like Jan Grobowski. Um, so it, it's, it's, it does have an impact, uh, a real impact. And this is why we need to continue basically, you know, contesting right. um, that law. I was, I was uh, thinking about that trial because I've been reading about it in his mm -hmm. uh, Grabowski's uh, posts on Facebook about it. And I mean, do you have any sense of, are they likely to be convicted? And if they were, what would that actually mean? You said the jail sentence has been removed, but what would actually happen? They would have a, they, they would have a fine, most likely. They would have a fine. I mean, there's a lot of that in Poland. You can of, often sue your political opponent or other people for defamation, you know. I mean, that, so, I mean, that's, that's part of what is happening in that case. Uh, but it really opens up um, scholars, you know, to, to be fine and to have to spend all that time. There's another case also that was perhaps less famous in the US, um, was, was um, Bilevich, a young sociolo sociologist, uh, he's a social psychologist who gave a, a talk at the Polish Museum of the History of Polish Jews. He was talking, he does research on anti-Semitism and prejudices. And he gave an example of an anti-Semitic cartoon, showed a picture of the cartoon. And there was a deputy from Law and Justice in the audience who filmed him. And then the cartoon artist sued Bilevich for showing his cartoon as an example of anti-Semitism, you know, so. Um, you know, he's a young, he, he's a very respected uh, scholar, but he's, you know, he's not a full professor. Actually, his full professorship has been held up, at, you know, by the president of Poland. And these are, you know, it takes courageous people to kind of venture into that domain. Right. And as you say, in some ways, one of the most one of the most frightening aspects of it is the way it will it will likely lead to a kind of self self censorship and to people yeah. never putting forward the kind of work that could potentially be controversial in these ways. I, yes, that's I think that's the most problematic yeah. aspect of it, yeah. uh, especially when that research is really kind of blooming. Um, and when there's, you know, Polish archives are full of those stories and it's a very it's an so far it's an aspect that we've heard from family stories from survivors but that hasn't really fully been studied by by holocaust scholars um so it it's got an, a very important scholarly uh contribution and it also has a very important social and cultural contribution to make to poland to basically come to, to terms to, with their own history is this something that you find yourself thinking about in the course of your own work? Do you worry about this? Or do you feel like you're removed enough that it's not? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm studying, you know, the memory of those things and not the actual, you know, the, the actual crimes. Mm -hmm. So that's different. There's like, I'm, I'm one, I'm removed <laughs> from that. Right. Um, I mean, of course, people can always not like your work, but I, I, I'm not, I'm not a target, mm -hmm. um, neither by my own identity, I'm not Polish, um, nor by the topics I choose to study. Mm -hmm. So earlier you mentioned this concept of, of narrative shock and that Poles in the, I think, especially in the post-communist period have undergone a kind of narrative uh, shock. Could you say a little bit more about that phenomenon and tell us a little bit more about how you're using that concept? Sure. 
Yeah. So, you know, identity, you know, personal, familial, uh, national, <laughs> social, also sometimes too, is built around stories, right? So it's stories of, you know, you have stories of origins, growth, decline, uh, pain, treason, endurance, resilience. And so challenging um, these stories, one or two or three, um, is really impacting questions, the very identity of, of the people targeted by that. So for Poles, uh, the narrative shock came from questioning uh, the, the main story of victimhood. Right, and with the publication of Neighbors, that was even greater because not only now Poles were not the victims, the main victims of the Second World War, but they were perpetrators. Uh, and that really shook that story of victimhood to the core. And that, that story of victimhood in Poland, that it's, you know, it's not born during World War II. This is a story from, you know, the 19th century and Poland built an entire national mythology um, around that story, choosing, you know, Jesus to represent Poland, you know, martyrs for the sins of the world, etc. So there's a very strong victim complex. So questioning the story of their victim, victimhood um, during World War II has really, really shaken um, Polish national identity. And that's why I, I call it narrative shock. It seems like a really useful concept that would apply in other contexts also, mm -hmm. of course. I mean, yes. in its own forms. I was just thinking as you were talking that, um, you know, I think the U in the US, the national identity is not so much formed around victimhood as you've been describing for Poland, but of a certain kind of uh, virtuousness, perhaps, right? And, and so I'm, th I'm wondering if something like the Black Lives Matter movement doesn't create a certain kind of narrative shock for a certain segment of Americans who are not used to having to confront the sort of deep uh, complicity of American institutions and ideals in right, white supremacy, uh, ra racist police violence, et cetera, et cetera. I think that in the, in the American case, uh, virtuousness, but equality of change uh, of chances and equality before the law, you know, this is a, a republic. And so you have these ideas that are at the core of the American project. And I think that especially the, the violence, the murder of George Floyd really shook that story, right? Um, and even last week or two weeks ago, what we saw, you know, protesters invading, storming the Capitol. Um, and some of the first reactions were, can you imagine black persons doing this, right? Uh, no. So there's, these are events that actually then question that central tenet of equality before the law, equality of chances, and that could create, that can create and did create um, this kind of narrative shock in the US so that by this summer, you finally had white people kneeling, including police officers, right? So I think that we see the, these are triggered events that change consciousness and it's important then to embrace them when they happen. Right, it's fascinating, important. yeah. I mean, so I think in you, you talk, in addition to narrative shock, you also talk in your work about what you call the national sensorium. Yep. which I take it as a kind of embodiment of national myths, right? As the kinds that we've been talking about are the way they're embodied in the built environment, the landscape, in rituals, traditions, et cetera, et cetera, ways of feeling and being. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, now back to the Polish context, what's the relationship of the Polish national sensorium, as you term it, to Holocaust memory in Poland? Well, so Polish national mythology and the main narratives of Poland is, is, is as I mentioned, is, is Poland as victim, as Christ among nations, right? So Poland built an entire uh, mythology, but strong narrative of, you know, reading of its history in relationship to that myth. So Poland was partitioned, so killed and would resurrect, for example. It's using a lot of Christian, metaphors to, to think about its history and its political situation. 
Um, so yeah, Poland uh, uh, crucified in the 19th century, then again um, during World War II, again under communism, etc. So when you think of that, the structure of that narrative, that mythology, and how it's embodied with, you know, in churches, for example, for Easter, you know, they have they have special uh, vigils where they pray for the resurrection of Jesus. So you have rituals like this. Uh, religious hymn that are that have become patriotic hymn and patriotic hymn that are religious hymns. You have all of this, th these layers of 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 uh, myths that are embodied and that reinforce each other. The Holocaust doesn't fit into this. You know, it's 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 really once you take like Christ as your main symbol to think of yourself, then Jews don't fit in that picture. Right, um, and so the Holocaust didn't have room in that national sensorium. What we're seeing, however, now since uh, since Jan Gross's book and the work of many memory activists, they're working with mnemonic devices. They're creating. They're trying to expand the national sensorium by incorporating the Holocaust, and they're doing that by marking uh, marking sites that were formerly Jewish, but that we might not notice were Jewish, for example. Um, and they're doing that by creating, and I will show you pictures of this, um, encounter the Jewish past of Poland and the, the erasure of that past. Um, and so there, there are attempts to kind of incorporate the Jewish past and the Holocaust also into a national sensorium, but it's a very laborious, you know, time consuming, little by little process. Um, but people are dedicated to it and cities are also working on that. So, you know, in Warsaw, it's, it was an initiative by the by the um, the, the Jewish Historical Institute with the city of Warsaw. And within a few months, you had all sorts of monuments that became that were erected to um, to commemorate the ghetto uh, uprising and other places of martyrdom of, of Jews uh, throughout the city. I'm fascinating. I mean, so one of the impacts of the Holocaust and the kind of political realignments that followed it um, were that, that Poland became a much more ethnically and religiously homogenous country, right? So obviously the connection between Christianity and Catholicism specifically and Polish national identity is one that goes way back, but there were large percentages of, or, or at least there are significant percentages of Jews in pre-Holocaust Poland, Ukrainians, other minority groups. One of the effects of the, of the genocide um, was to eliminate that kind of heterogeneity. But there still are some Jews in Poland today. There's a small population. I know you've done some research in those communities. So I'm just curious, like how do Polish Jews today or Jews living in Poland today respond to the kinds of, you know, compl this complicated landscape that you've been laying out for us and very contradictory landscape where we've seen some real progress, you know, in, in recent decades and then also a kind of backlash against that. So how did Jews negotiate that? Um, well, I mean, first of all, what you're pointing out about the demographic situation of Poland is key in this entire issue, right? So, I mean, Poland before the war was 60% 60, 60 approximately ethnically Polish and Catholic. 10% of the population was Jewish. And then you had Ukrainian, Belarusians, Lithuanians, etc. With the Holocaust and the, the, the shift westward to the of the borders, by 1946, Poland is you know 95% or so ethnically Polish and Catholic, um, and so that really solidified the association between Polishness and Catholicism in ways that now is so naturalized that it's difficult to think that Poland was different way back when. Uh, with that said, the J Jewish community is very, very small. Um, and uh, it's between, depending on how you count 
the criteria to determine Jewishness, there's between 5,000 and 40,000, so a wide range. But even if you take the largest number, it's a tiny population, especially when you think that there were three and a half million Jews in Poland in 1939. That, that uh, community, however, is very active, very vocal, uh, very vocal in public debates about anything that concerns the, the, the Jewish past, the Holocaust, the current situation of Jews, Jewish minorities, and other minorities as well. I mean, Jews have become also very often speaking on behalf of other minorities because they have more symbolic weight in a way um, than other minorities. More symbolic weight sometimes on the negative side, but also on the positive side. Um, so that's, I think that's very important. Um, there's also a, an institutional renewal of communal life. So now, I mean, think about this. Now there's two JCCs in Poland, right? One in Krakow, one in, in Warsaw. And the director of the Krakow JCC often likes to say, you know, jokingly that it must be the only JCC in the world that doesn't have a pool, right? So it's not, it's not a sports center. It's really, it's a, it's a communal cultural center for the Jewish population of Krakow, their families, Jews from outside who visit Poland and non, Jewish Poles who want to learn about uh, uh, Polish Jews. Uh, there's Hillel's now in Poland at Polish universities. I mean, this is unthinkable when you think of, of this like 10, 15, 20 years ago already. Uh, there's Jewish schools pre-K to high school, even though very often the majority of the kids going there are not Jewish, but still, you know, these, and you also have, you know, a variety of Judaisms, right? So you have from Chabad to the reform movement with a woman rabbi, you know, leading that progressive community. So um, there's really an expansion of, if not in number, in organization and public presence of the Jewish community. The situation of Polish Jews is, however, as you pointed out, it's complicated. Um, and they were very important in negotiating conflicts between Poland and Israel in the last controversy and in previous controversies uh, about the Carmelite convent at Auschwitz in the 1980s, about the crosses of, of, of Auschwitz in the late 1990s. They, say, they serve as mediators and intermediaries translators, right? So they explain to American Jews and Israelis what the meaning of Auschwitz is for Poles, and they explain to Poles what the meaning of Auschwitz is for Jews everywhere else, everywhere in the world. Um, so they play a critical function, um, and it's heavy stuff. I mean, they have, they bear the weight of basically doing that translation work um, and it also wasn't always easy because a lot of, uh, of Jews in the diaspora would question their choice to remain in Poland after the war. So um, it's led to tensions between different communities, but now there seems to be, you know, a good deal of reconciliation between different communities and um, and people who, who are very good, like the, the chief rabbi of Poland, Michael Schudrek, who's American, but has been in Poland now for 25 years. Um, he's a statesman, basically. I mean, he's really involved in work of cultural policy um, and uh, cultural diplomacy between different actors who are involved in, um, in the Holocaust property restitution and all of these things. I mean, he's the one dealing with different parties and that's very important, but also difficult. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Would you say there's a, a fair amount of cooperation at least between the Jewish community and the sort of more liberal progressive wing of Polish society? Is that what's behind the kind of renaissance of Jewish culture in Poland that's taken place? Um, well, I mean, there's a renaissance that's, that's done because Yes, there's a there's a relationship 
in the phenomena, not, not necessarily uh, between groups and people, although there, there is, but I don't want to generalize. But I think that the general um, social climate up to the coming to power of this current government who's a right-wing populist party, very close to the right wing of the Catholic Church, um, Jews felt safe to take their place in public life, which led to an increased number of Jews. So people finding who knew that they were Jewish, but that could, could say so publicly and rediscover Judaism or Jewishness of some kind. And people who didn't know and learned about it and then embraced it, right? So there's this, on the one hand, a context that facilitated that renewal. Um, and then this kind of growth and energy of the community is also then feeding back into, you know, movements toward a greater liberalization of polar society. And you see, as I said, like many Jewish groups who support, uh, you know, LGBTQ um, movements in Poland, women's movement or animal rights movement, they see their position as also advocates for other minority groups. Um, and so these are movements that kind of support each other. Hmm. Really interesting. So, um, I mean, obviously there's a very particular, very specific history that Poland has, I mean, and that you've been um, explaining to us in, in, in really useful, productive ways. Um, but I think maybe in to sort of start to wrap up our discussion, um, I'd like to broaden the discussion a little bit because so much of what you say also resonates beyond the Polish context. Um, mm -hmm. The kind of populist turn that you've been describing in Poland is one that we can see in many other countries around the world, including our own here, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and indeed, it seems like the, some of the transformations that are happening in terms of Holocaust memory in Poland are also ones that in different ways one can find in other places. So it struck me that there was a kind of, a really kind of a transnational, almost global consensus about Holocaust memory that emerged in the immediate post-Cold War period. So late 80s, early 90s, you had a kind of turn and, and uh, as people have called it, kind of globalization of Holocaust memory and a kind of consensus that Holocaust memory could serve as the basis for a, a universalist human rights project. Right. Um, but it does seem to me in the last several years, I don't exactly know where I date it, um, there has been a kind of erosion of that consensus. And there has been, and, and again, it hasn't just taken place in Poland, though something like the, the, the speech law there, I think is one example of it, perhaps one particular kind of example, or in Germany, the rise of the IFD, right, this far right party who's entered parliament and has really questioned the tenets of the official German Holocaust memory, which, you know, so many people see as a kind of model for how to, how to come to terms with the past. So I'm just wondering if you if we could talk a little bit comparatively um, and, and if you see what's happening or how you see what's happening in Poland in relation to things that are happening in other places. Well, I mean, yesterday was Martin Luther King Day mm -hmm. and the 1776 report mm -hmm. was published, right? right. Um, I was reading the report and I was thinking, gee, this is the same move that Law and Justice did when the day before uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day, they published their law and made that appeal. Okay. It's a very similar move. So I, I think that this is, I mean, this is very problematic in many, many places, especially since there is no longer centers of authority about truth, right? Either um, people who rise above the, the, how do you say, rise above the fray, the fray. Mm -hmm. and then they're, they're recognized as uh, authorities, you know, moral and uh, intellectual authorities that, you know, can establish a standard about truth or the good. Um, even in the U.S., when you think that the New York, New York Times was, you know, was recognized as the, the newspaper of record, right? 
and now it's attacked as fake news. So we're in a moment of basically the rejection of, of, of truth. We're in a moment of post-truth truth and extreme relativism, but actually coming from the right instead of coming from more liberal, you know, uh, milieu like it was in the 60s and 70s when the concept of cultural relativism was coming up, right? Um, and uh, there are no arbiters anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you have no central authority and no, and you know, everyone is reading their own feeds that's being fed to them by some kind of algorithm. Um, it's, it's difficult to, you know, how do you even talk to each other? I mean, you don't have the same facts. Um, I think that Poland is polarized like never it's been, um, in, a, in a way similar to that of the US. Um, and even though propaganda, historical distortion, etc., existed well before the current moment, I think this is a, a, of a different kind now. Um, and uh, I think that this is also instrumentalized by populists to mobilize their constituencies. It's a political tool that's actually very dangerous. And it doesn't always work in the short term. So we could think, okay, perhaps what's happened in the US in the end, you know, might mark some kind of turn, but I'm not sure. And I think it will take, you know, it, it does damages well beyond, you know, a political term, for example. And I'm thinking also back, thinking of the experience of communist countries, right? Who dealt with that kind of propaganda for, years after the fall of communism, even the most ardent uh, uh, people in the opposition, anti-communist people, still believe a lot of the stuff that the communists had told them. It's hard to, to basically clear that. Um, so that the socialists were telling polls that, you know, Auschwitz was uh, the place of the of of uh, martyrdom of the Polish na nations and and other nations. This is what the current right wing government is saying. There are things that even though you oppose a specific regime that you ingest and you assimilate and that become part of truth. And undoing this takes much more work than actually making it in the first place. And um, I think this is what you know. Historians, their work is crucially important. Uh, historians and sociologists, because we're we're also historians of the present, mm -hmm. right? So working now and trying to debunk to debunk all of this to kind of um, set the record straight in a way is is very important. So clearly there is, there's reason for concern, I think, both in Poland, but also in the United States and in Germany and Israel, around the world, really. Hungary, Hungary. And Russia. Indeed, indeed. Turkey, I'll add into the mix as well. Right. So, yeah. many, so many places where these issues are really at stake. And I guess I just, you know, not to add, not to add on a, a, a falsely optimistic note, but just to say that I think in that context, it is precisely the kind of work that you're doing, the kind of work that many of us are doing, which is both scholarly, but also has very real pedagogical implications um, in terms of the transmission of this knowledge uh, to future generations, to broader com public communities, I think is so important and probably more important than ever. So I'm really grateful to you for joining us, taking, part, taking part in this conversation as part of the 1939 Society program of 1939 Society, a, an organization that was founded by Polish Jews who survived the Holocaust and emigrated to, to Los Angeles after the war. So I think it's very appropriate that we're having this uh, conversation under the auspices of the society and of course the Levy Center for Jewish Studies here at UCLA. So thank you so much. and. Uh, I'm so much looking forward to seeing this book uh, on philo-Semitism and anti-Semitism in Poland uh, completed and published. Thank you. And I want to thank you for the, the opportunity to, to talk about these issues, which are not easy, uh, but important. And I, um, 
I think you're absolutely right about uh, we need, as scholars, we need to really shift how we understand our mission. Um, and teaching and, and raising public awareness is, is becoming more important than ever. So Absolutely. thanks for inviting me and Absolutely. thanks for the work you do. So important. Thank you very much. Thank you.